When's the last time you got some really bad news? I mean, some bad news that kind of um, trumps everything else that's going on in your life. It doesn't matter how busy or it doesn't matter what's going on with the kids or family. Like, you get a bad news and everything stops. Um, I remember about 15 years ago, we were setting up on Sunday morning. Um, we just started this church and we're at the Starlight Theaters and we're just hoping that, you know, 50 people would show up and um, all the, you know, goes into it. And we were getting there, I think, at 5.30 in the mornings and just setting up and getting ready for everybody to be there. And I got a phone call um, about 6 o'clock um, from my uh, father-in-law and uh, he said, hey, um, Mindy, my wife, her grandmother had died unexpectedly uh, in the night. And, um, you, you know, that's the kind of news that just, you know, it just stops you. I mean, it, it's personal. And you care so much and, and, and you're devastated by it that it doesn't matter how important everything once was, it's not that important anymore. Not as important as what's right in front of you. When's the last time you got some kind of news like that? We're going to talk about bad news today. We're going to talk about what our response is to it. And one of the reasons that um, we're, we're starting at this point, we're in a new series called All In. And in a sense, um, it's like, hey, we're at the front edge of an invitation that God is extending to us, our church, uh, to involve ourselves in, in him and his redemptive work in this world uh, in a bigger way than we've ever been a part of before. God's invited us by opening different doors up for us to step through. Um, he has opened the door for us to uh, purchase uh, a, a prime piece of property on Rocky River Road, close to 485, directly across the street from the entrance to the emergency center there uh, that just opened a year ago. Um, it's a perfect location uh, for our church. On top of that, he's opened up some partnerships uh, with groups of people and businesses who uh, have agreed to come in and build the buildings for us um, so that we don't have to incur the cost of building. On top of that, buying this land, um, we're, we actually have contracts on this land that are about uh, 40% for what its actual value is. And so, you know, as I've looked out the, the course of, you know, planning this church, starting this church, looking out into the world and saying, God, we want to make a difference here. We want to make a difference locally. We want to make a difference globally. You know, where, where do you want us to do this? And as we've searched and searched and sought the Lord on where he wants us to be, you know, long term, you know, permanent location and how that's going to happen. Um, we've honestly been pretty patient in the process. There's not a whole lot of churches that are sitting here uh, 16 years later about to step into this. But most of that's because we just didn't want to put our resources, we didn't want to tie up all of our resources in, in land and buildings. And I've grieved the fact that uh, I see a lot of churches pouring a lot of resources, a lot of money, into facilities and buildings that honestly they only use about three or four hours a week. I've always felt like um, in my own heart that that's just a terrible stewardship of the Lord's resources. And so how do we design a facility and in, you know, enter a facility in a way that the community naturally engages this building seven days a week. Sometimes it's for church stuff. Sometimes it's just for celebrations and parties and things that they do. Uh, you know, how do we get creative about positioning ourselves in this community where we have a greater capacity to respond to the bad news in this world? And honestly, that's what this is about. We've got contract on a land, uh, nine acres of land, a little bit over nine acres. Um, the contracts are for $925,000. Um, that's a lot of money. And God is inviting us into this. It's a property that's worth two to two and a half million dollars. Um, again, we have some really, really strong partners that we've been developing these partnerships for a lot of months. And uh, some of you are in this B workshop that's been the last three days, and you got to hear, um, like, you got to hear their heart and their stories 
and their journeys of how God has brought them to the place in his kingdom that they're serving now and how they want to partner with us and really come alongside us and allow us, this, this gathering, to partner with them in a venture that, honestly, it is blowing my mind to think that God's inviting us into this. As with God's invitations, they, they don't come without sacrifice. They don't come without a commitment. A lot of times in the scriptures, God, God tests people to say, hey, it's just, if he makes it too easy, then it's just, he's not sure he has your heart. But God's paved the way. All of our leadership has, has just kind of vetted this out and said, hey, this is, this is what we're going to do. This is what God's inviting us into. But let me tell you, this is not about a land, and it's not really about a building. Honestly, at the core of it, it's figuring out how we as a, as a group of people can have a greater response to the bad news in this world that comes at us every day. The bad news that there's thousands and thousands and thousands of kids who go to sleep tonight without a mom and dad to tuck them in without family. The bad news that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of young ladies worldwide that are active slaves in a sex industry that consumes them, uses them, and abuses them. The bad news that there are millions, millions of people around the world who have never, ever even heard the name of Jesus Christ. Never. They don't even have the hope of responding because they have never heard. The bad news that within a 10 mile radius of this property on Rocky River, there's 250,000 people, a quarter of a million people who do not have any kind of relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, the bad news is really bad news and it is so bad that it's hard to have a passionate response to the bad news. I mean, that's bad news, but honestly, some of those things really don't stop us in our tracks. Why? Because it's not our child that's going to bed without a mom and dad. It's not our daughters that are in sex traffic slave industry. It's not, it's not our family that has never heard the name of Jesus Christ and has no hope of responding to the good news. You know, it, it's, just, it's just hard when bad news is so prevalent to figure out a response that's big enough to make a difference. And sometimes because we don't have a response that, that we feel like is even going to matter, we just kind of get callous, get complacent, and kind of sit back and do nothing. Well, guys, I was not built to do nothing. And uh, this church is not here to do nothing. You guys know that. And we've been excited that we feel like God is leading to this, us to this place where he's inviting us to go all in with him so that our response and our connection to a world that is full of bad news is, is a message of hope. It's a message of real help. It's a message of removing aloneness from this community in ways that we've never been able to do that. It's a message of being able to invite and interact with the community in natural ways seven days a week during the day, in the evenings, with families, with those who are traveling, with people who want to celebrate the great celebrations in life. We're going to be able to be right there in the mix. At their highest highs and lowest lows, that's where we want to be. So we're starting this series and we're kind of using this story that's found in the Old Testament. And uh, it's a guy whose name is Nehemiah. And Nehemiah uh, gets some bad news about the world. And we're going to look at his response to this bad news this morning. And as we do this, I want to kind of diagnose and dissect his response because I want his response to be our response when we hear bad news in the, in the world. And guys, like, if you haven't got enough bad news, like, just get ready for it because the next six months of political season, all it is is more bad news. Like, that's the that's the ticket, all right, is let's show everybody how bad everything is so that we can set ourselves up to be the response for that. So listen, it's just, 
If you're not sick of it yet, you know, it hadn't even started. <laughs> and so you really got to figure out a strategy here. And that's just the political realm. With the stuff that really matters, with, with life, with things like hope, with things like love and joy and peace, like, what's our response when we, when we see a world that is void of all these things that God intends to be regular parts of our life? What's our response to say, hey, this is not okay? So let's dive into this story. Because Nehemiah, um, it just opens. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a, a guy who's kind of in a prominent position. Uh, prominent but expendable. Let me tell you what that means. He is the position, he's the cupbearer to the king. I've said this before because it's one of my favorite stories. But the cupbearer is a really important position because what you did in your service to the king was that you taste tested everything that he ate and drank. Which meant that if it didn't kill you, then the king was okay to eat it and drink it. All right? And so, like I say, you're a pretty important guy. It's a very trusted position. However, you're in that position because you're also expendable. Yeah. I mean, if you died, you did your job. That's kind of how it goes. And so that's kind of the position of Nehemiah. It's, it's, it's a lot like, um, you know... In, in this world, the best thing I can relate it to is I've never had a, a daily housekeeper. I've never, my kids have never had a nanny. But, you know, in, in realms like that, you, you get people, and I'm not saying they're expendable. They're not going to face death if they don't take care of your kids right. But um, actually, the kids might kill them. But, you know, however that goes. You know, it's just this situation where they are, they're, they're real valuable. They're almost part of the family because they're there every day. And you kind of get to feel like their emotions, you know when they're having a good day, you know when they're having a bad day, and that's just kind of the relationship. Well, that's the position that Nehemiah has with the king of Persia. Now, with the king of Persia, this is the Persian Empire. Uh, before the Persian Empire, historically, there's the Babylonian Empire. Babylonian Empire came in and wrecked Jerusalem, tore down the walls of Jerusalem, exported everybody of significance. Anybody that could potentially rebel, they deported them so that they could keep a close watch on them. And so you've got the nation of Israel, the people of, uh, of, of Jerusalem scattered, okay? And then the uh, Persian Empire comes in, and they have a little different policy, but some people are still in exile, and Nehemiah is one of those. But the king of Persia has also said, you know, he's allowed some travel back and forth, and he's creating a few alliances, and so he's allowing people to kind of move around a little bit. Well, this is where we kind of pick up the story. In late autumn, in the month of Kislev, which is the month of November or December, uh, on the Jewish calendar, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I, Nehemiah says, I was at the fortress of Susa. Han and I, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. And I asked them about the Jews had returned, um, who had returned from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. So some people have been in captivity. They returned and they're going to, you know, inhabit Jerusalem again. And Nehemiah's like, hey, how's it going for those guys? And this is what he, he receives in response. says, things are not going well. For those who return to the province of Judah, they are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Now Nehemiah gets some bad news. Again, it, like bad news comes at us all the time. But it's real critical how we respond to it. I mean, it is so vital. What is our response when bad news hits us? You know, there's some possible responses that Nehemiah has that you and I have. I mean, when we hear the bad news of the world that's out there, when we feel aloneness in this community, when we know that there are people who really have nobody to rejoice with when they are rejoicing and nobody to weep with when they are weeping, when you feel that, like, what's your response? 
Well, there are a couple possible responses. One, I mean, Nehemiah, I think, could have been like, big deal. So what? I mean, the reality is, Jerusalem, the walls have been torn down for 140 years. <laughs> this is not news flash, you know. This is not new news. Now, it's a little more personal because some of his friends had returned there to inhabit the city. So he knew some guys who were going back to, you know, re-inhabit the place. And he was concerned about them. But the news hadn't changed. And honestly, that's our response sometimes to bad news. Hey, David, like, there's always been people that have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. There's always people that are lonely. We're never going to solve that. Big deal. In fact, 140 years ago, you know what happened 140 years ago? Anybody? January 30th, 1876, you know what happened? Anybody? I'm surprised you don't know this. Shame on you. History buffs. Any history buffs? January 30th, 1876, you know what happened? The native Indians were sent to reservations. Big deal, right? Yeah, it's kind of like, okay, Dave, wow, big deal. I mean, a lot of them are still there. But you get it? Like, Nehemiah could have been like, <laughs> really? I mean, duh. 140 years ago, man. Get over it. You know, that had been an easy response for Nehemiah. Big deal. Another response is like, you know, actually, that's not so bad. I mean, at least they get to live in Jerusalem. I've never even seen Jerusalem. I've been in exile my entire life, his entire life. He is an Israelite, and he's never been able to live in, in Israel. He's kind of lived his whole life in captivity or servanthood. Another response may be like, you know what? Well, that's tough for them. They should like, get busy and do something about it. I mean, Nehemiah's like, I am hundreds of miles away. They got 24 hours in the day just like I got 24 hours in the day. They got effort and ingenuity. At like, you know, that's their problem. They live there. Solve it. That's an easy response. It's an easy response to kind of, in churches, it's an easy response. And some of you come at me at this sometimes. You're kind of like, David, like, why, why do we build houses in Mexico? We should be building houses around the corner. And I say, yes, we should be, both. It's not an either-or proposition here. But you kind of come at me with this idea like, hey, we should just care about our own right here. Like, why, why don't we go to Ethiopia and try to make a difference? And I'm like, well, it, it's because it matters. But it had been so easy for Nehemiah to be like, man, let them deal with it. Or, you know, hey, I don't know, but this might have been Nehemiah's response. Hey, you know what? I've carved out a decent life here. I mean, I'm the cupbearer to the king now. I've got a little bit of security because, I mean, some security. As long as nobody's trying to kill the king, I'm okay. And I've got a nice little niche of life here. And I can just kind of coast. So don't bother me. And you know, I, I think here in suburban America, like, it's real easy for us to get that way about bad news. We've kind of insulated ourselves from seeing too much poverty, from seeing too much brokenness. The brokenness that goes in our community, sometimes we try to suppress it and kind of hide it, kind of cover it over. Wealth sometimes masks the real desperation in our hearts and our lives and in the lives of those around us. When people are facing financial future, you know, collapses in this community, then there's, a, there's like a, a, an unspoken pressure to make sure nobody knows about that because that's not acceptable out here. You know, it's just, let's insulate. You know, hey, we've carved out a nice little slice. Everybody's got their opportunities. Everybody's got their problems. We've, we've, we've carved out ours right here. And let's let everybody else worry about their stuff. 
Well, this is Nehemiah's response. So just get this. It's 140 years since this has happened. He hears that the walls are broken down. And this is his response. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. You know, I, I'm wondering what kind of news would be bad enough to stop you in your tracks. I mean, so that the world stops. Everything that was once important is not important anymore. And I'll be honest with you, like, there's not a whole lot of news that rises to that level. I mean, you know, grave sickness, a death in the family, tragedy, you know, disaster, accident. Like, there's few levels that we would say, stop the press, stop everything. But usually those are only things that are really close and really personal to us. You know, I, I don't want to beat you up here because I, 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 I'm one of you in this respect. Like bad news comes at us so fast. Like between the news, the, you know, radio, TV, um, media, online, social media. Man, like bad news, it's, it's always been there, okay? Throughout history, bad news has always been all over the world. Natural disaster, murder, all the chaos, okay? It's, always, it's just that people didn't have the opportunity to, to, to be aware of it like we are today. And so we almost have a tough time to figure out a response because we kind of feel like, golly, if we had this response to bad news, we would just be sitting in a puddle all day long. I mean, if our heart was broken by bad news like this that happened 100, I mean, if your heart was broken because the American Indians are on reservations, like you've been crying your whole life, just sitting down in a puddle. And so it's, you know, it's almost like, well, I don't even know how to do this. they like, yeah, there's bad news, but I mean, life goes on and I kind of got to go on. And my question is, well, let's, let's wrestle with that for a second. Because what makes you weep? I mean, what breaks your heart? Some of you, you don't have an answer for that. And, and those, those are the people I'm actually a little worried about in the room, okay? If nothing breaks your heart anymore, there's, there's the bad news in this world has built up a little bit of too much callousness on your heart. And, and you're not ready to respond. What breaks your heart? What makes you weep? And does it have anything to do, anything to do with God's love for his people? I mean, some of you Duke fans. You know, but the Carolina, you know, but come on. I mean, what breaks your heart and does it have anything to do with God's love for people and his desire to see his image grow throughout the whole world for people to enjoy the love and peace and joy of a relationship and being in his family? And what breaks your heart? And does it, God, does it, does it break God's heart? You see, like Nehemiah, he allowed, honestly, he allowed his heart to be captured by what captures God's heart. You know, God's heart breaks at lostness in this world. Does yours. You know, God's heart breaks at abuse. Does yours. God's heart breaks for marriage breakdowns and family struggle. Does yours. God's heart breaks for the lonely. Does yours. God's heart breaks for where evil has come in and stolen and destroyed and suffering reigns because of that. God's heart breaks for those situations. And my question is, does, does yours, does it enough to sit down, to stop for a second? Does it break your heart enough to weep? See, here's the reality. Bad news is only bad news if it reaches our heart. Otherwise, it's just news. And my question is, are you letting anything reach your heart? 
Are you letting the desperation of our world, like your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers, the 250,000 people within 10 miles of this property that, that don't have a relationship with God? Or, or even worse, think God is angry at them. Or even worse, think God is against them. Or even worse, deceived into a form of God that, that enslaves them instead of gives them freedom. I mean, does your heart break at that? Because God's heart does. And it's only bad news if, if it breaks our heart. The Bible has a lot to say about our hearts. This one passage you might have heard before, it says, guard your heart, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Your heart leads you, and it determines what direction and path you take. And listen, so many times we, we talk about this verse, hey, there's, there's bad influences out there, so guard your heart. Don't let anything in. Because that's good advice, because what is in there guides you. So be careful what you take into your life, what you allow and receive and accept. Be careful. That's guarding your heart. Let me tell you, it's not just defense, though. It's offense. Like, there's certain things that we need to let into our hearts. And some of you have built up a wall, and the church is great at this, unfortunately. We built up a wall and not let anything affect us, evil or good. God's heart himself can't even break in to our hearts. Guarding our heart is offense and defense. It's intentionally allowing certain things in so that our heart becomes like God's heart. And it's keeping certain things out. But here's the great promise of God for every single person here. It's found in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. It's God's promise to his people. I think it's true for us today. And God says, and I will, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. If you just are like, man, you know, David, I don't think I've wept in years about anything in this world. I don't think I've even stopped and let bad news affect me. I certainly haven't let the lostness of our world and our community impact me. Well, here's a promise. God says, I'll take out your stony, stubborn heart and I'll give you a tender and responsive heart. Listen, this is the work that you can't do, I can't do, no amount of teaching, no great church, no speaking, no discipleship. None of this can change the human heart, guys. None of it. Only God can do this work. But he will do it if you invite him to. He will take out your stone and stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. Nehemiah says, I stopped, I wept. In fact, I mourned and fasted and prayed to the God of heaven. I mean, he's all in, right? I mean, his response is all in to this. God, I'm going to let my heart break the way your heart breaks. And he sits and, and fasts and prays. Look, um, everybody needs one of these journals. Okay, so if you don't have one, if you just slip your hand up, some people will come by and get you one. But this is a journal not just for today, not just for this week, but for the next six weeks. Because we've got um, an opportunity to kind of guide you along here. And at the front of it, it talks just a little bit about our journey here as a church. Um, on pages probably five through nine or so, it talks and gives you a little instructions about fasting and prayer. But I want to guide you to have Nehemiah's response. And we're going to do this together in fasting and prayer. Some of you are like, oh, this is really getting high bar, David, because I've never done anything like fasting before. In fact, you were fine with me until you start messing with my food, and now I'm not so sure about you. Well, listen, I, I'm promising you you'll survive, okay? I'm living proof that you'll survive. I'm only asking you to fast one meal a week, just one, okay? And it can be any meal that you want it to be, all right? 
but make it, make it intentional. Don't just wake up at 11.45 on Saturday morning and say, well, I fasted for breakfast. <laughs> yeah. I know you, tricks. I do the same thing. I'm one of you. Like, don't, hope that counts, God. That was a tough one. Or some of you don't ever eat lunch. You know, okay, it's, it's, it's fasting, okay? Give up one meal, one meal a week. And take that 45 minutes or an hour that you would spend eating, or some of you don't even take five minutes to eat, so carve out a little bit more time and have, and have a devotion. And the devotion for this week is on page 12, right here. It goes along with the message today. And then it's got a, a question here, and it's got a place for you to respond. Because listen, there is nothing I can say or do to get you all in. And let me tell you why. Because you can't go all in without a heart response. You see, when people try to get you to go all in when it doesn't come from within, you feel manipulated. You feel managed. And honestly, your response feels hypocritical because you're like, well, I think i got to do this or I feel obligated to do this. Listen, we are not doing that, okay? My desire is for you to be all in, but my heart for you is that that would come deep within from a genuine heart response, from a heart that's been impacted by God. And only God can do heart surgery on us. Only God can exchange our stone stubborn heart for a tender responsive one so my job is to get you to spend time with God that's it now that's dangerous okay because God can do in five minutes what I can't do in five years okay so it is dangerous it is an all in response it's just not all in response to me it's time with the Lord so together, you know, Mindy asked me last night, hey, what, what, what meal are you going to do this week? And, you know, I was like, well, I think I'm going to do lunch on Wednesdays. And so, you know, that's for me, but like whenever, okay? Take time, fast, spend some time in prayer and respond to God in this journal. And let's just see what he does. Because see, when we pray... This is what happens. And some of you are like, hey, I'm not even really sure what to say in prayer. Hey, I, I'm almost like, hey, I don't care. I'm going to give you a few things to pray about. But I don't care what you pray when you pray. Because the fact that you just get to prayer means a couple of things. Let me tell you what it means. It means, number one, that you've humbled yourself. Because you, you say, hey, I need somebody besides myself to fix me and this world. That's a step of humility, just declaring, I, I, can't, do, I can't do this. When you just start praying, no matter what you say, you have believed that there's a God who cares and has the power to do something about the problems and the bad news that comes at us every day. When you just start praying, no matter what you say, you are growing in your faith by anticipating a God who's going to respond. And when you pray, no matter what your prayer is, it, it comes from a heart that's broken. Like, that's the most genuine response. And so... Regardless of what the content is, the fact that you're praying says all of those things about you. Now let's look at what Nehemiah prayed real quick. And I'm just going to read it. And some of you are aware, like we, we kind of, part of our discipleship model is to lead you to respond to the Lord. And you respond to the God by saying, hey God, what are you saying to me? And what am I going to do about it? And that's this rhythm of repenting and believing. And you look at Nehemiah's response. You look at his prayer. See if you can pick out those two things. Repentance and belief. Look at it. Verse 5. O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. Listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess, I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. You see the levels that he's saying? Like, 
Ultimately, he's repenting for actions of his great, great, great grandparents who disobeyed the Lord, and that's why they are in exile to begin with. But he's not just blaming them and their sin. It's my family. It's my sin. And he's repenting. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Now please, God, remember what you told your servant Moses. This is why the promises of God in the Bible are so vital. Because one of the most powerful things you can do and pray is just remind God what he promised you. That's what, that's what Nehemiah does. Nothing special. He just says, God, remember... You said to Moses, if you are unfaithful to me, I'll scatter you among the nations. And that's exactly what's happened. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, even though you're exiled to the ends of the earth, I'll bring you back to the place I've chosen for my name to be honored, Jerusalem. God, you've promised that if we repent and we believe your commands and we believe your promises, that you'll return us to this place. He's reminding God what God has promised. And then he says, the people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those who delight in honoring you. And then he makes one request. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it in his heart to be kind to me. I think this is genius. Because Nehemiah knows he's not going to manipulate a king. He's not going to coerce him. He's not going to negotiate his way into favor. It's funny. Nehemiah wants the king's heart to be changed. But see, that's how you and I are. Like when we're facing a problem that has a name to it, like our spouse or our kid. Or our boss, or our roommate, what's our prayer? God changed them, their heart. Oh, that's Nehemiah's prayer. It's a good prayer. But so often when I pray that prayer, the first thing I hear from God is like, yeah, I think I'll start with your heart, David. And I'm like, crap. Because we just want to. We just want everybody else's hearts to change. We want everybody else to not have a stone cold heart towards us. We want a responsive, tender heart. And I think God's just saying, hey, let's start with you. Let's start with us. Yeah, God has the power to change every human heart. Every human heart. He tends to start with those who invite him. My challenge to you is to go all in. And, and going all in requires a heart response. Otherwise, it's just manipulation. It's just coercion. And you're going to come along, but you might come along kicking and screaming. And, and that's not all in. Go to God. Invite Him to change your heart. Invite him to break your heart the way his heart breaks for the news in this world. And then let's see what he does. Going all in when bad news comes means that we allow our hearts, we allow our hearts to be broken by the emotional, physical, and spiritual condition of others. We're just not going to be callous to it anymore. Going all in when bad news comes means that we confess to God. We repent of our indifference and callousness. And guys, like, we all have some callousness. Daily, another layer of callousness kind of builds up. And we just confess that. Going all in is fasting and praying. Saying, hey God, we're serious here. We want to do that. And I just, I just ask you to do it. To discipline yourself to do it. And then here's a prayer. I'll suit this out for, through our tech system. If you're not on our tech system, make sure you sign up for that and do that information's on the email and other places. Uh, I'll shoot this out versus email, and it's on the U version today. So if you're logged in on the live thing right now, then it's here. 
but it's just a simple prayer that can kind of get you started. It says, Lord, please open my eyes of my heart so that I can see what you see. Show me my community the way you see it. Help me to feel your heart for others. And break through the hardness of my heart so that I can be receptive to your leading. It's a good prayer. It's a good prayer. Who doesn't want that? And then the question that you wrestle with in the book is, is what are the greatest needs of those who live right around me? Where does God want to open up your eyes to care a little more than you care right now? To allow your heart to, to be engaged here. Guys, let's do this. I'm so excited about the plans that God has for us. His invitation to us is amazing. And listen, he's asking you to go all in. But God is a God that always goes first. God went all in with the bad news of our sin. And he went all in and said, here's my son, Jesus Christ, sacrificed for your sake. He was all in for us. And so our all in is only a response. It's only a response. And it starts with your heart. Will you pray with me? God, thanks for inviting us. God, I am I'm floored by your work by your love for us, by your care, by your patience with us. God, we have been far, far, far from perfect for almost 16 years. And God, um, we're standing right on the front edge of this. And you know my hopes and my dreams are wrapped up in this. As long as, as well as a lot of others in this church. Because we've been hoping, praying, searching for this for a long, long time. And we feel like we're right on the front edge of this promised land. And we feel like it's not just our will, it's your will. But it's going to require something of us. And we're grateful, Lord, that you've gone first. We're grateful, Lord, that anything that we do is just a response to your love. And we're grateful for the opportunity to make a difference that is going to last way, way, way beyond any of us. It's going to outlive us. And it's going to be a place where love happens and aloneness gets removed and truth gets embraced. And people step into your family for generations to come. Help us to go all in together. Trust you with the results. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.